Last week, we looked at one must be born from above, or as the scriptures also could dictate, must, one must be born not only from above, but again, in order to see the kingdom of God. You see, the new birth must come before the new life in Christ begins. We talked just a little bit about divine sovereignty and human responsibility. I'm sure we answered all your questions. I really like what Spurgeon had to say about this because the Bible teaches both and you have to hold to both to be, I think, a good theologian, which we're all theologians. We study God. Listen to what he says. Can you understand it? For I cannot. How a man is a free agent, a responsible agent, so that sin is his own willful sin and lies with him and never with God. And yet at the same time, God's purposes are fulfilled and his will is done even by demons and corrupt men. I cannot comprehend it. Without hesitation, I believe it and rejoice to do so. I never hope to comprehend it. I worship a God I never expect to comprehend. Now to deny this truth because we cannot understand it it is to shut ourselves out of a great deal of important knowledge. Be careful. You don't hear me saying that God doesn't make sense. No, he does. Perfect sense. The problem with us is we have a very flawed sense. We're the creation trying to explain the creator. There's only so far we can go. As a matter of fact, I think the apostle Peter would agree with you. I know he would. When he's praying in Acts, 40, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 27 and 28, he puts both divine sovereignty and human responsibility together. And you come away scratching your heads and you praising the Lord. Listen to what he says. He says to the Lord, truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Did you catch that? <laughs> Wicked men put him on the cross. I'm looking at them today, our sin. And yet the Lord in his sovereignty, that was the plan. That was his hand in it. So the Bible, it doesn't answer all your questions, but it teaches both. I know I've ordered copies of Attributes of God or in the back uh, today by A.W. Pink. You can read your Bible first before you read any of that. Uh, Pink does a good job. He doesn't do nearly as good as what Scripture does. But it's helpful. It's kind of a mini uh, theology book on the, on the attributes of God. So that's last week. Let's tackle this week. Today, we're going to see Christ meets Nicodemus where he is. He even uses some of, of uh, Nicodemus' own words and we really can learn from this. One of the commentators lines these out. Many times, if we're talking to people about Jesus Christ, we're wondering, how does, where's the angle? Where do they look at us and say, what must I do to be saved? And you go, ah, oh, there you go. Now I'll swing. No, no, no. The Bible, it, it lines out basically ways that we can encourage folks. We can meet them where they are. And Jesus is meeting Nicodemus where he is. He's even using some of Nicodemus' own words. It's interesting. You'll see it up on the screen. Nicodemus in verse two, he says, we know that you are a teacher. Verse 11, Christ says, we speak of what we know. Also, Nicodemus says, you are a teacher in verse two. And Christ says, are you the teacher? Verse 11. Nicodemus in verse four says, how can a man be born? While Christ says in verse five, unless one is born... Also, Nicodemus says, can he enter in verse 4? And Christ says, he cannot enter. And then finally, Nicodemus says, how can these things be in verse 9? And Jesus says in verse 10, you do not understand these things. So he uses some of his own language. I think it's interesting, and I think it promotes what the scriptures say. 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Nicodemus, you're not born again. You're responsible for everything I'm telling you, but there's no way you're going to get it unless you're born again. So we're going to see that. And we'll also see the last verse 
Ethan and I talked earlier this week, and he says, how are you going to explain that last verse? Christ ends up comparing himself to a snake. We're going to save that for next week, and Ethan will be teaching that. <laughs> oh. It is disturbing, but Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. And I think hopefully by the time I'm done explaining it, you will say, oh, that's a great analogy. Not because of me, but because of Christ is using that analogy. But strap yourselves in. We'll be there in a moment. Take a look at John chapter 3. In order to understand the gist of verse 9, we have to read verses 5 through 8, what Jesus is saying. So chapter 3, verse 5 through 8, and then we'll go on to verse 9. This is the word of God. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? So Nicodemus is listening to everything Jesus is saying. You can't enter the kingdom, Nicodemus. None of you can, unless one is born again. And Nicodemus says, how can that, these things be? Question, congregation. Can a brilliant teacher ever be completely wrong? And Nicodemus is realizing that. He's basically, he's, what's going through his head seems to be my explanation of how one enters the kingdom of God is wrong. And I have taught people this for years. What has Nicodemus been teaching people? Probably a combination of many things, but I'll mention two. Number one, he would look at the average Jew at that time and would say, you're a child of Abraham. Congratulations. You're not a Gentile. You're a Jew. Uh, secondly, um, you obey the law. Perhaps you do the best you can, is what Judaism would say at that first century. And by the way, that's not what the Old Testament teaches. Old Testament teaches you're saved by faith in Christ or faith in the Lord. But here, by the time first century came around, Old Testament teachings had been so messed up that Nicodemus was basically saying, your heritage and your works, that'll save you. And Jesus is saying, no way. Verse 10, Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet do you do not understand these things? So remember Nicodemus, it said, he said he marveled, the text said he marveled at the words of Jesus. Now Jesus is saying, you marveled at me, Nicodemus. Now I'm marveling at you. He calls him the teacher of Israel. What does that mean? Well, it uses the article the, so it, perhaps it means that he was the foremost teacher in Israel, or at least one of the most outstanding teachers of Israel. People would know Nicodemus, yes. And he says, you don't know these things? The, the things being the fact you cannot see the kingdom unless you're born from above. So, and it's interesting because Nicodemus had enough Old Testament information to know a person must be born again and that that is done by the Spirit. And you see many of these passages, and I'll list a few in the Old Testament where God has to perform heart surgery, take out the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh. The Spirit falls on them. He makes them a different person. All this, all these information that, that you're familiar with being of the New Testament, but those Old Testament passages contain that information as well. You see it in Isaiah 32, Isaiah 44, Ezekiel 36 that we studied last week. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 33 says this, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. I'm going to do this. Joel 2, 28, I will pour out my spirit so Nicodemus had enough information. He should have been like, hmm, okay, explain that a little bit more. Okay, yeah, Isaiah passages, Joel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, there's plenty in there, but he doesn't get it. Verse 11, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness of what we know, but y'all do not receive our testimony. Once again, if you're new to grace, I'm not giving you the Texas version of the Bible. 
I'm telling you, on those you phrases that are plural, it's important to point those out. Uh, Nicodemus is perhaps coming as the official representative of uh, the Pharisees or maybe just a small contingent. So he's not just talking to, to Nicodemus in a sense. Nicodemus is going to take this information and he's going to take it back. And he's saying, the problem with y'all, you don't receive our testimony. Now, note this. Jesus is now speaking in first person plural. He says, we speak of what we know. What was Jesus there with some others? No, he was with Nicodemus by himself. Well, who's the we? I can give you four options and I'll tell you which one I like the best. Number one, Christ here is relating to John the Baptist. Remember, the Pharisees would be very familiar with the teachings of John the Baptist. And so when John the Baptist says, there's come one coming after me, he's gonna baptize you with a spirit. And so Jesus is perhaps saying, my cousin and I agree. We, we speak of what we know. That's what Luther held to. Luther thought that was the case. Uh, another way to look at it would be Christ is relating himself to the Old Testament prophets. He's saying Ezekiel, Joel, Jeremiah, uh, many others are speaking about the spirit falling on people and the word of God written in their hearts. And so perhaps that's what he is saying. I agree with the Old Testament prophets. I sent them, by the way. Uh, so that's what Calvin viewed. The third option would be Christ is relating himself to the Godhead. John Chrysostom wrote this in the fourth century that Jesus actually does this much in the book of John where he talks about we, um, that my father, myself, the spirit, even though one essence, three persons, it could be what he's doing here. A fourth option would be Christ is imitating the words of Nicodemus from verse two. Remember, Nicodemus said, we know, we know that you're a teacher because of your signs. And it's like Jesus is saying, really? Is that what we know? Um, hmm. Let me tell you a couple things that actually we know. Um, you can take it, any of those four options. I like the third one. I think Jesus is actually doing this because of what he's about to say then I think he's actually referring to himself in the Godhead. He will say at a certain point in John, I don't need further witnesses. You know, everybody needs to have a witness of what you did, like in a court of law. And he says, I don't, basically, I don't need any human witnesses. The witness I have is the Father. So it can be any of those views, though. And notice this, he says, we know. Now, it's important to note that even though Nicodemus said, we know that you're a teacher, Nicodemus isn't speaking a theological truth. He's just guessing. The, the, teach, the teacher before him must be pretty important because he's doing great signs. But Jesus is saying we know. He's speaking doctrinally here, like thus saith the Lord. And what's so fascinating about that is the rabbis at that time, they quoted other rabbis to appear credible. They would, uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Hillel would be one of them. Uh, another one, Shammah. There was many others and they would quote them and then they would give their teaching. I quote people. Um, why? Because they say it better than me. Um, the truth, oh, they nailed it. I can't say any better. And that's right on the money. Plus, y'all don't think I'm a heretic if I quote some really solid guys. Jesus doesn't quote really anybody. Or if he does, he corrects it. Take a look. Well, I'll just quote it. Matthew 5, 27, he speaks with authority and he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. He does this throughout the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard this, but I tell you this, no rabbi does that. But Jesus Christ can speak authoritatively because he's God and he wrote the book. He says, uh, we bear witness to what we have seen, not just what we know, but what we have seen. It's like Jesus is looking at Nicodemus and saying, Nicodemus, I'm an eyewitness of this whole born from above things. Um, it's divine reality. John 1, 1 and 2 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. It's like he's looking at Nicodemus and saying, I was there, brother. I know what I speak of. You can't come into the kingdom unless you've been born again. But know what he says, y'all, 
do not receive our testimony. Now, that's interesting. You see, he's saying, you don't accept my eyewitness account. John 1.11 says it like this. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Don't feel sorry for Nicodemus here, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the cause of Nicodemus' disbelief is not lack of education. He would have the Old Testament memorized. It's not lack of evidence. Romans 1 talks about the glories of God that are revealed to us in the creation of the world. He knows the things of God. It's his unbelief. He didn't believe. Anselm in the 11th century and Augustine, much earlier on than that, they said in essence the same thing, I believe in order that I may understand. So many of us go, well, you have to explain it all to me first. And then if it makes sense and I have good evidence for it, then I'll believe. But the problem is, is that's not describing the works of a Christian. The Christian believes and he understands. Now, we don't want to be foolish in our understanding, of course, but it, the point of it is if the Bible says it, we got to believe it. We got to move forward with it. It's interesting because the Bible even tells us how to do that. Hebrews 11.3, it says, by faith, we understand. Now, I'm not saying we, we talked about divine sovereignty and human responsibility, and you go, well, I don't understand all that. Well, there are many, many things that we don't understand about God. But the point is, if we come across something in the text and we go, I need to believe that. The Bible says that that's wrong. It doesn't matter what I'm feeling. The Bible says that I have to hold to it because that's what Bible says to do. Hebrews 11, three, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Why am I creationist? Well, many reasons, but Hebrews 11, three, by faith, we understand. Bible says you was created in this way. It was created. I'm not an evolutionist. Why? I'm a Christian. Some of you go, oh, that's too harsh. I don't know. I think by faith we understand. Now, just to be clear, there's differing views on how everything came about, but we have to hold it. Yes, God created the heavens and the earth. There's differing views about older creation, younger creation. We're not getting into all that, but he's the creator of the universe. So as we believe and we trust the Lord, he gives us greater understanding into his word. Failing to, for Nicodemus to believe that you must be born again, in some senses, to reject the knowledge of Jesus' divinity. Jesus is telling you the truth. Believe him. Verse 12, he says, if I have told y'all earthly things and y'all do not believe, how can y'all believe if I tell y'all heavenly things? Christ knows both earthly and heavenly things, yet if you people won't accept earthly things, how can I move on to speaking about heavenly things? What does he mean by earthly things? You can take it one of two ways. Maybe they're the same. There's little difference. Maybe what he's saying is the things that are on earth, like the physical analogies that I'm giving you, like, oh, unless a person is born of water. He's talking about being born again or things like the wind blows wherever it pleases. These are physical realities, earthly realities. And he's saying, Nicodemus, you don't even understand those things. How can we move on to heavenly things? Or he could be saying this, the things that take place on the earth rather than in heaven. When a person, even though they're born from above or born again, it happens, it happens here. The Lord doesn't translate me to heaven take out the heart of stone and put in the heart of flesh and send me back to the earth. No, no, no. It happens here on earth. So that's what Jesus could be saying. These are earthly things. If you don't understand earthly things, how can I talk heavenly things? Heavenly things being, oh, I don't know. The fact that Jesus is looking at Nicodemus and he's saying, I'm God in the flesh. Or perhaps his plan of redemption, the love of God to the whole world and not just to Israel. That could be seen as a heavenly thing. How he would save us. Now, let me ask you all this. Are there any applications for us here? I mean, one of the commentators states, God will not reveal to us a higher truth until we have thoroughly apprehended the simpler ones. 
Good example, I'll never forget 10th grade geometry. 10th grade geometry. Some of you moaned, some of you cheered. We had Mr. Williamson come into class. He was a tall, lanky fella, thick glasses. He knew his stuff. He was brilliant. He was um, funny. He was a great teacher. And within weeks, I was failing miserably. <laughs> Geometry didn't come easy for me. My parents can attest. My brother's girlfriend's dad a volunteered. He called my parents and said, I heard Jeff is struggling and I'd like to, to tutor him, which was really kind on his part. And I met, his name was Mr. Reich. He's with the Lord now. Not in any way related to the Third Reich and Hitler, but he had the, the last name, great family. And uh, he met with me in certain weekends and I was able to grasp a little bit more. I struggled the whole time, but he's an engineer, I think, and he was very smart and he helped me through it. And so by the time the 10th grade was over, I passed. You'll never see my report card. I even took my buddy out for uh, a Burger King lunch and I said, it's on me, brother. But I couldn't move on until Algebra 2 until I got done with geometry. Maybe some of you can, but I could not. But it was a struggle, terrible struggle. And you know, I can't help but wonder, are there, hmm, are we appropriating biblical truths into our lives? Could we be further along if not for two things, lack of faith, we're just not trusting the Lord, that he really means what he means in the Bible? Or could it be just our lack of obedience? We believe it, I just ain't gonna do it. I mean, God's sovereign, I'm not pulling that back, but I also am saying you also have passages like Hebrews 5 that lines us out. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. He says, about this, he's talking to the Hebrews, about this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you, don't, you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone else to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the, in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What's the problem with these folks? They're not, they're not appropriating the Bible. Either they're not believing it or they're not acting on it. And those are the two things, trust and obey. And keep in mind, as the song we, beautiful song we sang earlier, it's grace alone. We're not pulling back from grace alone. But the fact is, is the Lord, he wants us to join us join him in his work. I mean, can you have baby Christians for life? Some of you go, right here. Well, I guess you can. I mean, you certainly have those that produce 100-fold, others 60-fold, others 30-fold. But as a believer, you want to grow up and stop drinking just milk. And as you appropriate these things, the Lord brings us on to other things. How can I explain to you heavenly things? You can't even get earthly things. Verse 13, he says, no one has ascended into heaven except he who has ascended from heaven, the son of man. Some believe that that is a good example of soul sleep. I don't think so. I don't believe in soul sleep, that the soul does not go to heaven and just goes to the earth and waits for the great day of Christ. Return. I see Luke 23, 43, surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise, he says to the man on the cross next to him. I, I think really verse 13 is, is not Christ describing an event, he's describing himself. I'm the one that was there and I came down, I'm going back again. You see, there was a tr Jewish tradition that some of the prophets went to heaven and came back down again. It's almost like Jesus is saying, no one has ever gone to heaven and come back to earth again. Now, others may have gotten a heavenly vision like Isaiah, Paul, John, but Jesus is the one that has the access both up and down. Verse 14 and 15, then he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have 
eternal life. You get the picture of Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus the whole time is scratching his head going, how can these things be? I don't know. And then Jesus says, hmm, let's use an example. How about the Pharisee's greatest hero, which is Moses? And note what he does. He says, the man that y'all so much trust in is actually the same one chosen by God to give his people a type of the cross to come. Here you go, Nicodemus. Surely you remember this story. Well, keep your finger there. Go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 21. Numbers 21. Background, the country of Edom, who were really just long lost cousins of the Israelites, Edomites have denied Israel permission to cross their land into the promised land. So they have to go all the way around Edom to enter the promised land. The people grow impatient and they get into grumbling. Aren't you glad we're not related to them? Let me tell you what, just as a side note, don't give yourself a pass for your grumbling. Don't give yourself a pass for that. Philippians 2 makes it clear we should do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation among you whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of Christ. Then he goes on, so on the day of Christ, I will not forsake that I did not run or walk or carry on in vain. Paul looks at them and says, you got an issue with grumbling and complaining. And let me tell you what, two things. Grumbling, it tends to start at an early age. Any of y'all told as a little kid, would you stop complaining? And you look at your life now and you go, I'm, that's me. Now, keep in mind, it could begin at any age. But when we start saying things like something goes wrong and you go, figures. It's complaining. It's grumbling. And not only does it begin sometimes very early, it can begin at any time, but also it's catching. It's catching. We're drawn to that. Don't be that guy. Don't be that gal. You're supposed to be the one that's rejoicing in the midst of tribulation. Well, back to Numbers, lest I have a second sermon for you. Verse four through nine. Now, from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient, which brings out many times grumbling, became impatient on the way. And and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent or or copper, as some of your translations say, and set it on a pole. And if a a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now keep in mind, these folks weren't just small complaints. I mean, they're complaining against God, against Moses. They don't like the trip. And notice what they're saying. Verse five just, just kills me. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Or verse four, there is, for there is no food and no water and we loathe this miserable food. Y'all, manna was not miserable food. The Bible says in Exodus 16, 31, manna tasted like wafers made with honey. Think of the incredible ingratitude that would be. Incredible. And that's what's happening when we're losing patience and complaining and grumbling. What? We're not okay with the Lord anymore. Lack of gratitude. This, it's almost like we have to remind the Lord, have you forgotten I'm my own God? No, we're not. Katie, bar the door. 
And that's what's happening here. So the Lord sent fiery snakes to bite them. Fiery, it could mean that they were red, but in all likelihood, it could have meant that's how you felt right before you died. You're on fire. You've been bit by several things, perhaps in your past, insects or bugs or animals. Hurts. This was horrible. People were dying. They asked Moses to pray. The Lord told Moses to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. Everyone who looked at the bronze snake lived. Those who refused died. And the question that comes to mind for us might be, why a serpent? Why a snake? I mean, serpents and snakes, that's a picture of Satan in the Bible or sin. But don't you dare forget Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. If God wants to use a snake, he can use a snake. And really, in a lot of ways, it is a perfect analogy. It's perfect. Why a serpent? Well, think of it like this, why I say it's a perfect analogy. As a person lays dying, he actually has to look away from the snakes that are biting him, and he has to look to, he has to look to the only object that can save him. What's the problem with that? The object looks just like the things that are biting him. What does that mean? Well, Put it like this, the only remedy for our sin is found in the one who became sin for us. The sin that is killing you today, and it is. And as we look around, I see several people that limp, and you know what I mean, the sins of your past. And you're limping, and as Jacob does, he prays to the Lord for it because God in his kindness met with you and he wrestled with you, and he always wins. And even though you look back and you go, I wish I could go back. I wish I'd have never done that. Fact of the, Lord, fact of the way is, is that the Lord in his kindness, he broke your legs, as one of the commentators has told me before, one of my old seminary professors, he broke your legs. And now you limp. But what do you do for a God that doesn't break your legs? Well, you don't know if you're a believer and you go on to hell one day. But praise God that you limp. But the fact is, you don't want to keep on limping. You don't want more limps. You don't want another broken arm. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Jesus said, I'll take the curse. And he became a curse for us. So as the snakes are biting, they have to look upon a snake and realize that that is the object that God uses to save his people, the one that became a curse, that became sin for us. And so he says, Jesus says, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Notice he doesn't say, so may. He said, so must. It's like Jesus look at Demas, looking at Nicodemus and saying, there's two reasons why I have to be killed. Number one, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You cannot save yourself, Nicodemus. And number two, the only way to be born again is life comes from death, and in particular, the death of myself. He says that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. First reference in the book of John of eternal life. We'll talk more about it. So what he seems to be saying is the cross is the means by which we are saved. What's the manner in which we are saved? It seems to be belief. That's the term used. Whoever believes may have eternal life. It doesn't matter how big or how many times you have been bitten by those snakes. You look and believe. You know, it's interesting. I didn't come up with this. Others have. The pathway to us falling into sin, what did that, what did that start with? It started with a look. Genesis 3, 6, the woman saw that the tree was good for food. She saw it. She looked. You see, the way out into condemnation was looking, but the way out of condemnation is the same way. Look. Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me, God says, and be ye saved in all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no one else. As the Lord gave physical life to all those snake-bitten Israelites who looked away from the snakes, biting them, and looked to the bronze serpent, so the Lord gives eternal life to those who look away from their sin 
and feeble attempts to save themselves and looks to Jesus Christ on the cross. The people could not do anything. They couldn't do anything to save themselves. You, you probably think that they would be like, can we just get rid of the snakes? Just get rid of the snakes. And God said, we're gonna leave the snakes they be. Look to the snake. Look to the one that saves. And you may have run across people before as you talk to them about Jesus Christ and they would say, yeah, I know we're saved by faith alone, but I have to do this. I have to be baptized and baptism is good. Um, I have to do this, do this, do this, do this. And they'd say anything else is just foolishness. It's just foolishness that you can say, I'm trusting in Christ alone for myself. It's got to be something you do. Well, 1 Corinthians 1.18 actually predicts this. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved is the power of God. Now, just to be exceptionally, hopefully clear, when I say believes in him, I'm not just talking intellectual assent. I believe in George Washington. If you've ever taken evangelism explosion, you know what I'm speaking of. I believe in George Washington, but I don't believe him to save me. He's dead but I believe he existed. Some of you would say, I believe in Jesus Christ in the sense of he existed, he's the son of God, he saves sinners. That's the, that's the belief of demons. James 2.19, even the demons believe in shudder. No, are you looking and trusting in Christ alone for your salvation? That's your justification. A true believer looks upon the Lord as his new shepherd. You have a new shepherd. The old shepherd was you and the devil. Congratulations. And by, by the way, how do you grow in your relationship with Christ? Do you think looking could have something to do with it? You'd be right. Hebrews 12, 2, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're still looking. Looking in his word, looking in prayer, we're looking. You know the sad part about that bronze serpent? I'd like to see it, but it was destroyed. 700 years later, it wasn't destroyed by some foreign enemy. It was destroyed by a godly man named King Hezekiah. And you go, why would he destroy the bronze serpent after 700 years after that event? Well, they had destroyed it because people started worshiping it as an idol. What began as a symbol of their salvation became the very thing they trusted in for their salvation. What am I getting at? Please hear my whole quote. The cross doesn't save you. Wearing a cross doesn't save you. Having a cross in your house doesn't save you. That doesn't save you. Jesus Christ dying on the cross saves you. Why do I say that? Because some people say, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I believe Jesus died on the cross. Many unbelievers believe that Jesus died on the cross. But are you trusting in Jesus Christ, the one who died and rose from the dead? That's a big difference. Why would anyone not look at the bronze serpent? Have you, have you thought about that before? What are these Israelites doing? Just look at it. Just look. They wouldn't. He'd say the same thing. Why doesn't people, why doesn't everybody look to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Why not take the remedy for sin and receive eternal life? Ultimately, I think it may come down to many things. They're blind, they're dead, but they don't think they need it. They don't realize that they're already dying from the poisonous effects of sin. And it's not just gonna kill you in this life, it's gonna kill you for eternity because you have to pay for those sins, but no payment is ever sufficient. What they need to hear from you and I today is the poison for mankind he's dying from. Christ came to drink that poison. He not only came to drink the poison, he now offers waters of eternal life to all who come to him. Would you look to him today? Becoming a believer is nothing more, nothing less than looking, looking to Jesus Christ, trusting him alone for your salvation, realizing that you are wicked, you are on the way to hell. And look, look and live. And if you're a believer today, surprisingly, I give you the same advice. Look and live. It's not you, it's Christ. It's grace alone. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for 
The study of this strange topic of Christ saying, look to a serpent. And yet, Father, Christ gladly and willingly took on that role. Father, we thank you for that. We're thankful that you saved us from before the foundation of the world, but also you sent your son to, to make payment for that. The Spirit drew us just one at a time. Pray for anybody in here who's not yet know your son as Savior. Grant that to them. Make them be born again. I pray that they would believe. I pray for the rest of us in here that we would be followers of Christ every day, constantly looking to him, never looking to ourselves. In your son's name we pray it, amen.